So when I was a child, my favorite cartoon was the Jetsons. And um, I always wanted to be Elroy. That was, my, uh, that was my modus operandi when I was a kid. Now, for those of you that don't know about the Jetsons, it was about a family that lived in a futuristic utopia called Orbit City in the year 2062. And in Orbit City, they had flying cars, they had robots, they, um, they also had people movers, and the main character of the show was George Jetson. Now, George Jetson's job at Spacely Space Rockets was to push buttons on this control panel, which he did amid various naps throughout the day. Um, he worked three hours a day, three days a week, which was a typical work week uh, of that time. Now, the premise of the reduced work week as it related to the Jetsons compared to our 40-hour work week today was simply that process automation had evolved to the point where it obviated most human labor. Therefore, it allowed the Jetsons and other citizens of Orbit City to follow um, more of their leisure activities, for example, watching television, uh, playing sports, uh, uh, shopping in a lot of cases. So the question arises today that if we extrapolate from where we are in 2014 out to 2062, will we achieve a Jetsonian existence by that time? Well, I think to answer that question, we need to take a look at some current technologies that are certainly driving us in that direction. <clears throat> now, I see the world as this very complex, integrated network of processes, which I call our social process ecosystem. Now, processes as part of this ecosystem are either manual in nature, which I have represented here on this graph as blue, or they are automated, which I had represented in this graph as green. Now, <clears throat> the, we as citizens, or we as humans as part of this ecosystem, um, we are an integral part, and we provide input to the ecosystem, and we receive benefits from the ecosystem um, in the form of food and water, uh, we health care, for example, security, housing, and so on and so forth. Now, the role of technology within this ecosystem is to continuously improve the operational efficiency, effectiveness, and capabilities of this overall ecosystem. And the technologies that support this are really focused on improving our overall quality of life. Now, technologies that are um, introduced in the ecosystem, um, in some cases, have a minor impact. In some cases, they have a major impact or a very disruptive impact. So if we look at some examples of very disruptive technologies, uh, one that comes to mind is the invention of the printing press in 1450 by Gutenberg which at that time issued in the era of mass communication, uh, as well as the proliferation of knowledge well beyond the intellectual elite uh, at that stage, which really changed society at that time forever. Other innovations included the mechanical assembly line in 1867, and then also the commercialization of electricity in 1880. But I would contend that a innovation or an invention that was first conceived in 1962 by a little-known scientist at the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA as it was known at that time, also a former professor at MIT named J.C.R. Licklider, uh, who penned an idea in a memo to his colleagues at ARPA called the Intergalactic Network, which was this idea of networking computers which would ultimately become the main communications medium for the world. And seven years later, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, brought Licklider's vision to fruition with the development and deployment of what was called the ARPANET. And that was the first operational packet switching network whose first transmission was actually recorded on October the 29th, 1969, and set in motion one of history's most disruptive technologies as we know it today as the internet. Now, what is so disruptive about the internet. Well, the internet simply, as it relates to our ecosystem, supports the collection, computation, and communication of information 
between all the hum human elements uh, within our ecosystem. And it's the speed and efficiency by, by which this is done that drives amazing gains in overall productivity. Now, as such, the internet has completely disrupted very manual and inefficient processes and delivered very innovative business models across all of our society. These include areas like uh, retail and e-commerce, for example, uh, also uh, print media, and most importantly, music. Um, if you think about it, uh, the internet has now revolutionized the supply chain of music, therefore making the old record store a relic of the 20th century. Now, what if I told you today that these disruptions that we've seen since the Lick Lighter days of 1969 are minor tremors compared to the seismic shifts that we're about to see with the next generation of the internet. And these seismic tremors will impact all of, us, all of society together. So let me explain. So if you think about our process ecosystem for a moment, and you think about all the major industries that drive our global economy, retail, manufacturing, healthcare, aerospace, transportation, and now think of the billions and billions of physical assets that underpin those industries, the equipment, the infrastructure, also the facilities. Now each of these pieces of equipment or assets or things as we call them have the capacity to generate data that if processed by software can drive revolutionary improvements in operational efficiency and effectiveness. Now we need a new type of internet to do this, not the old communications internet of the JCR Licklider days, but we need an internet that comprises very advanced sensing, networking, communications, and analytics that support the seamless integration of humans, assets, and computers in our social ecosystem. And we call this the Internet of Things, whose capacity for generating improvements in productivity has been estimated in the trillions of dollars. So let's look at an example of how the Internet of Things will disrupt a number of industries and some that we're very familiar with. And let's take healthcare. So let's imagine that today uh, you don't feel well, or I don't feel well. So I wake up in the morning, and I don't feel well, and I need to see my physician. So I call down to their office, and I talk to receptionists, and I ask, please get me in to see the doctor today. They say, come on down, we'll try to fit you in. So you go there, you wait, they hand you a clipboard, that's the first level of data exchange. They then key all of this information in. You then wait for a while. They finally call you back to do some diagnostic info, or to collect some diagnostic information. You go back into the back uh, where they do this, blood pressure and so on and so forth. Then you go back and wait some more. You go to the doctor. Then he does a third level of data collection. And then he takes all of this information. He aggregates it, to get, aggregates it together. Um, and then he makes the diagnosis and makes the prescription. He then hands you a sheet of paper, in some cases keys it back into the system. You then take this down to your pharmacy you acquire your medicine, and then you, then you uh, take it home and you treat yourself. Now let's think about how IoT is going to disrupt that entire process. So now I wake up in the morning and I don't feel well. I walk into the bathroom and I have a variety of different sensors that are electronically connected that will take all of this diagnostic information. Those sensors will then process that information in real time, extracting certain features um, from those signals. And then it will communicate it to the cloud where there's a very advanced software analytics platform that runs that to match it against certain illnesses and diseases and also match that against certain prescriptions. It will immediately then make a diagnosis or recommend a diagnosis, a prescription for that, send a information uh, straight to your doctor where he gets a report on the issue. He hits a button to approve it. That information is then sent to what I would describe as an off-site pharmaceutical location where an automated process will then fill that prescription, deliver it to a bay, where it's then picked up by an airborne drone and dropped on your front door. A complete process that had very little human intervention. Now, if you can envision the process automation and the productivity even in that process, we're gonna see these types of processes expand and proliferate across industries all across the world. This includes industries like transportation, also, manufacturing. I think the Internet of Things will repa repatriate manufacturing in the United States because of these types of productivity gains. And also farming, where sensors are deployed across large farms to make the process of growing crops and delivering those crops tremendously efficient to the world. Now, we talked about 
what the Internet of Things is going to do in the near term, let's talk about a few key technologies that are in the research pipeline that will take the Internet of Things even to the next level. The first of these is brain-to-computer interface technologies. So both physicians and engineers today are building systems that can take information from your brain with sensors and process that information in real time to send messages and directions to computer devices. And all of this based only on your thoughts. Another area is in cognitive computing, where advancements in artificial intelligence and machine learning are pushing the boundaries in terms of new software applications that can process enormous amounts of unstructured data to, to deliver a level of understanding about our world that we've never had before. And then in the third area is robotics. Organizations like DARPA and Boston Dynamics are building humanoid robotic systems that can almost perfectly mimic the locomotion of human beings. Now if you envision these technologies all integrated into one what I call Internet of Intelligent Things, now we're starting to have significant capabilities such as the ability to seamlessly interact with the devices within the network, have real-time access personally to some of the most advanced cognitive computing platforms to help us sol solve some of the world's most difficult problems, and then very advanced robotics platforms that will ultimately replace very manual labor and dangerous tasks that we have to accomplish as humans. So with this vision in mind, how close does this take us to the Jetsonian era of 2062? And more specifically, what does our society look like when we reach a level of process automation that looks like this? Will we continue to pursue our 40-hour work week? Will, like the Jetsons, we will allow us to spend more time in leisure activities and uh, activities of interest for us personally? Well, obviously these questions are uh, unknown at the moment, but I think we can rest assured on one thing, that the Internet of Intelligent Things will make George, job, George Jetson's job of pushing buttons in 2062 a thing of the past. Thank you very much.